It was that combination of class and R&B, and it's everlasting. We're really a funk mom kind of band, you know, at heart. It's like a prize fight. Oh, we knocked them out in Detroit. Okay, now what's next? I love that song. Tremendous presence. Total creative package. One that was under the radar. Funky from day one. Could have been a bigger band. That music will never die. In 1978, the classy funk pop band known as Rolls Royce was cruising down a highway paved with platinum. Everything was a blessing. Everything had something to do with a power that none of us had any control of. The group's first three albums had each sold over a million copies. Six singles in two years had gone top ten. Every song was a hit record. We had an album sell to platinum status in 30 days. I'm wishing on a star. Their success was based on a mix of talent and close relationships between a tight-knit band of brothers from the hood. We had the same uh, chemistry, okay? We all was focused on the same exact goals. A legendary producer with a Midas touch. If a chicken could cluck and key, he can get a hit record on it. <laughs> Simple as that. By the time Henry Garner, Kenny Copeland, and Freddie Dunn entered Washington High, they were bent on forming a funk ensemble like Earth, Wind, and Fire, or Cool in the Game. They scoured South Central for the best and most ambitious musicians they could find. They picked up two excellent instrumentalists from nearby Lock High, another school that had lots of gang violence and musical talent. Keyboardist Victor Nix and a 16-year-old prodigy on bass named LaQuint Duke Job. He'd already shared a stage with the Coasters, the Drifters, and James Brown. He was an incredible player. Anything he played, he'd pick up just like that, you know. And then he would play so fast on the bass. He would play bass, dance like James Brown, and sing and never miss a note. I said, listen, whatever it takes, we, we, we have to get this guy. <laughs> that turned out to be easy. After 10 minutes of jamming on a Cool in the Gang song, Duke was in. We started this song off and sounded better than the record. We all looked at each other, we just stopped playing on the same beat. Nobody cut it off, we just stopped playing it. We looked at each other and we just laughed hard as we could because we knew we had it. They gave themselves an ambitious name, Total Concept Unlimited, TCU for short. TCU caught a break when they heard that Motown artist Edwin Starr, he was writing the success of a top 10 hit called War, was looking for a backup band. Starr came down to the rehearsal garage on Haas Avenue to check the group out. He was so impressed that he hired TCU on the spot and talked them up to celebrated Motown writer-producer Norman Whitfield. The man behind I Heard It Through the Grapevine, Papa Was a Rolling Stone, Cloud Nine, and many other Motown hits. Whitfield loved everything about TCU, including the fact that they were from the hood. When Whitfield left Motown in 1974 and formed his own label, Whitfield Records, he signed TCU as one of his first acts. From the start, he had a vision of the group that was strictly first class. And he moved the guys into his Beverly Hills mansion to help prepare them psychologically for what was to come. The group was set, except for one final detail, a better name. Rolls Royce. We're not coming out at Cadillac or the Chevy or Volkswagen. We're coming out at the top. Woodfield saw opportunity when Universal Studios asked them to produce the soundtrack for a movie about, of all things, 
life in the South Central L.A. car wash. First, he had to convince Universal to take a chance on a bunch of unknowns. Then he had to convince Rolls Royce. The key, of course, was coming up with an irresistible title song. Inspiration struck while Norman was playing basketball at home with the guys. Rock. Once in the studio, Whitfield demanded perfection at every turn, starting with hand claps. It was like six of us, and we did that for almost two and a half hours. I was cussing, and then I got cursed out too, because a couple of times my clap got flat and bumped, and it started all over. The clap set up a funky mechanical beat, as if an actual car wash had rhythm, which is what Whitfield was going for. By the time Rolls Royce's debut album, Car Wash, was released in October of 1976, producer Norman Whitfield felt confident that he had stacked the record with hits, from infectious dance tunes to melodic ballads like I'm Going Down. Indeed, Car Wash the movie looked like it might bomb until the soundtrack took off. As for Rolls Royce, hearing themselves on the radio was a beautiful new sound. It just happened that fast. Spurred by the success of three hit singles, including the title track, the Car Wash album sold over two million copies and won the 1977 Grammy for Best Soundtrack of the Year. In the winter of 1976, Rose Royce hit the road for a nine-month tour, opening for a bill of R&B superstars that included Bootsy Collins and Parliament Funkadelic. But the stylish funksters with the triple platinum hit quickly moved up. Sharing a stage with funk mobs like Cameo and P-Funk, Rolls Royce needed some material that would allow the guys to throw it down. Wishing on a Star was an international pop hit, and in full bloom, Rolls Royce's second album went platinum, just like Car Wash had done. Two for two for the guys from South Central and the girl from Biloxi. While it lasted, Rose Royce enjoyed a spectacular run. Eight top ten hits in three years, and two more that went top 20. mid-80s, Rose Royce no longer had a record deal, and demand to see the group in concert had dried up. It was a steep fall for the aristocrats of funk, but one member of the band fell further than the rest. When I found my DLC, Drug of Choice, then yeah, I, uh, I kept that uh, as a, a shield and buckler against the pain and the uh, things that were happening to us. Well, when Duke left, he took a lot of music with him. As Duke's drug use got worse, he chose to live on the street. I was downtown L.A. 4th and Crocker. Okay, I was right there on the nickel, the concrete jungle. Everybody knows who I am. They know I'm the bass player for Rolls Royce. They know that I've, I've you know, had uh, X amount of dollars at certain points in my life, you know? So it wasn't always a safe place for me to just go anywhere and sleep on the streets, you know? 
the one-time wonder child of Rolls Royce, ended up spending four years in prison for drug possession. He eventually turned the corner on his habit and is now working on a comeback as the Duke of Royce. I'm in a very good place right now within myself and the world because there's no telling. I've learned to live that there's no telling what's going to happen next.